This is Data Podcast. Data Podcast. Data Podcast. Data Podcast. In the ever-changing world of data, this is the podcast packed full of information to keep you right on top of all the developments. From AWS and Azure, through to data science, big data, AI and NoSQL, and everything in between, we cover the essential updates from both a technical and non-technical perspective, including special guests and in-depth interviews. Now, please welcome your hosts, Rajiv Baha and Shabnam Khan, with today's episode of Data Podcast. Our guest in this episode is Joe Mutros and Alex Zilinek of Data.World. Joe Mutros is the Director of Product Engineering at Data.World, overseeing the product development and user research programs. He has spent the last 15 years working on early stage of consumer facing technology problems as a software engineer, product manager, entrepreneur, and consultant. Joe focuses deeply on data-informed product development, the magic at the intersection of measurement and testing, and hands-on user research. Previously, Joe Joe was the founder of Indeed Labs, the invention team inside the number one job site in the world. His team was responsible for envisioning the future of Indeed.com's product suit via invention and rapid prototyping and was the genesis of their entrance into new product categories. Now let's learn about our second guest, Alex. Alex Zilinek is a product and user experience designer currently helping people collaborate around data at data.world. Alex has spent over a decade designing and building products on behalf of agencies enterprises and startups whether through a mobile app analytics portal or social platform alex has a passion for translating ideas into positive outcomes i am shabnam and rajiv is hosting with me today welcome to our show gentlemen it's great to have you both thank you it's great to be here it's great to be here thanks thank you rajiv please take it away thank you shabnam you know most data experts at one point or another have been to one of those 2700 plus open data portals and data.world has made its own space out there. Unlike other open data portals, it is a crowdsourced data collection site uh, aiming to have quality data. And without it, I wouldn't have known facts such as uh, 80 million open data sets in the world or 2.4 million websites existence during Google's launch in 1998. We had a guest previously in podcast, so how impossible it, it will be count to all the websites these days. But I'm sure if somebody spends enough time, it will definitely be possible someday. And anyway, but I digress. Now we have seen some really interesting data, data collection offer on your website uh, when Hurricane Harvey hit. So I'm really excited to learn and hear a bit more about your portal. Can you tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like you, we were also really inspired by the rise of uh, open data and all of the open data portals, um, both, you know, brought in, brought forth by uh, government agencies or academic institutions or different companies. But we, we quickly found a couple of limitations uh, in that model. And that's really what inspired us, you know, to build data.world and to uh, into what it is today. So, you know, some of those limitations we found so, you know, first of all, was was that they're silos. So, you know, if I'm looking for a specific data set, um, how do I even know which portal to go to? So some da- some portals out there, like in the in the United States, uh, data.gov um, was a good step in that direction of trying to unify um, a lot of the like smaller open data portals from smaller municipalities. But you still end up with many, many different types of sites uh, to go to in order to try to find the data you're looking for. Um, we also found that uh, the data was um, sometimes just made accessible in that in the, those data portals, but not necessarily usable. So a lot of times they weren't anything more than just a file up on a web page available for download and nothing more. And so we realized that, you know, contextualizing that data could be uh, really, really interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that, but and then also, you know, making it social as well. So uh, data analysis, uh, data science is inherently a social exercise. Um, we saw, we were inspired a lot by what we saw in the open source software world and how, um, you know, software development becoming a social activity really raised the bar and uh, expanded software development to a much larger audience and, and really sped up the pace of, in, of innovation in software development. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about making the data usable in the context, you know, we really we're talking about this idea of, you know, number one, just crowdsourcing uh, the data uh, collection and sharing with with other people, um, bringing that context together. And, and, you know, context, we mean kind of, you know, interestingly, it's, it's more of an expanded definition, than I think a lot of other folks have. Um, but we think of things like documentation, possibly like methodology about how uh, the data maybe were collected. You know, there's always that question of, hey, what does this column mean? You know, this has got some strange code and I don't know what it means. Um, but even collecting non-data files alongside the data and then into the social realm, things like discussion, 
questions and questions and answers, you know, understanding maybe what other people have used this data for in the past or what problems they found with it or what enhancements that have been made to it. Um, you know, all of that we found was missing in the uh, in these these data portals. And I think finally, uh, you know, and this is kind of our ultimate vision is enabling collaboration around the data. So, you know, that's one step beyond making it social is how can we help people actually work together? And you referenced the uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, resources, you know, that was something, you know, we're actually based in, in Austin, Texas. And so that was a little close to home for us. And a lot of us here in the in the in the team uh, had folks, whether family or friends that were affected. And we saw this as an interesting way, you know, there's people collecting data and trying to do all this collaboration in real time, but there's no real way to help them come together uh, to to some common goal. And so that's really what we've uh, our, our vision for data.world is to, to collect all of this data uh, in one place and allow people to contextualize and collaborate on it and ultimately get to what they need to get to faster. Yeah, and to add, to add on to what Joe just said, so so obviously portals are a great place for sourcing open data. You know, we wanted to create a place where you could you could bring your own data and obviously uh, make it available for others in the community to use, uh, but also use your own proprietary data, be able to join against open data and come up with some interesting uh, output there. Really, one of the other things that contextual aspect of what we're doing helps with is, you know, we talk about things that are important to sourcing data. Relevance is obviously very important. So we think this added context helps us surface more relevant data sets for, for a lot of use cases. Obviously, the usability of a data set is important. The documentation and all the context helps there. Uh, you might have a, a data set, a table available in a, in a portal, but if it if you don't know anything about it, you're going to have a tough time fitting it to, to solve a problem that you have in, in the real world. And then last uh, is data set quality. Um, we get all these social signals on the platform based on people's uh, discourse around data sets, uh, what they're what they're using them for, what projects they pulled them into. And that allows us to have uh, a strong signal around quality so that other folks come along and are able to use uh, these data sets to suit their own needs. And one of the things that Alex just mentioned around the ability to use private data in our system, you know, that's really one of the core parts of our platform is that everything that you see with open data in our system, uh, you know, our, our members, our users are allowed to do the same with private data sets. And so you're finding a lot of people bringing, you know, the own analysis that they're doing on maybe data that uh, that cannot be shared publicly or, you know, companies and corporations coming and doing, um, you know, their own internal data work on the platform in much the same way that you're seeing it being done in the open. That's awesome. And I think that's really noble what you're trying to do, even if it's a painstaking process. So for all the data hungry pros requests for data sets, um, I have this question. So I know that dataset subreddit is a great place. What are some limitations of this of this portal? And I know you have touched on some of it, but if you could specify four common problems that are related to researching open data that you are trying to cure, that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I actually I really love the the Reddit, the, the dataset subreddit, uh, and I tend to spend a lot of time there just kind of browsing through and seeing what kind of interesting things people are posting. Um, I, you know, I would even go as so far to say like it's inspired us to see. You know, it's one of like an early example of seeing a community community pop up around um, sharing of data sets and what people are doing with those data sets. But we found that most of the interactions, um, you know, in that are, you know, were fairly, you know, simple interactions, like I'm posting a request for a data set, and then either it goes unanswered, or somebody posts a response with just a link, uh, or somebody posts an interesting data set, and then, you know, there's not really much discussion there. Um, and so what we, you know, want, we want to encourage is, you know, going beyond just the finding and sharing of data sets, but you know, taking that step further and encouraging people to discuss the data what kind of questions they may want to ask for it, uh, and even leading to um, some collaboration, um, you know, within the community. And ultimately, you know, we we really believe that, you know, for something like this to work, it must be, uh, you know, open. Uh, and, and that means, you know, being able to be open to the world, similar to open source. But even, you know, as I mentioned, inside of a company, allowing the, the data and analysis that works on the data to be open, even within a closed group, like inside a company, um, is still a big culture shift. Uh, it needs to be uh, social. And so that's one of the areas where I think our data sets does a, a good job. But, you know, to Alex's point earlier about collecting those kinds of social signals, it's more than just, um, you know, people talking with each other. But how can we use that social activity to help surface things um, in, a, in a more uh, in a more clear and useful way to people? And uh, we really believe, too, that the, the data uh, must be linked. And we actually, uh, you know, there's a there's a common um, there's a common concept called the network effect, which is typically applied to communities. 
I'm sure you know many of the listeners are familiar with this. And so you know it, it says that uh, you know the value of a network you know increases with uh, the number of nodes in the network. And so this is typically applied to social network analysis and how you know the network effect takes hold and it becomes very hard to like unseat social network and, and you know the growth starts to become exponential. And uh, what we found was you know if you treat the data sets themselves and the data projects that people are working on uh, the same way that people are treated in a traditional social network, then you can actually the, the value of those data sets and the effectiveness of what you can do with those data sets increases exponentially will follow that network effect. And so that's really, you know, we talk about the platform being social and linked and open, you know, that's truly uh, what we what we mean by that. Thank you for uh, sharing that insight about the nodes and network. Now, can you tell us more about these collaborative efforts your team had with around 200 data experts in various disciplines? Sure. So uh, from the very beginning uh, of our company, uh, we believe very strongly in being user centered. Uh, you know, my background is a, a user experience designer. Um, it, it's a domain where, you know, I didn't come into data.world with a lot of knowledge about what people were doing with open data. So research was a pretty obvious place to start. Um, so before we, we launched a product, uh, we got in about 75 interviews with everyone from universities, hospitals, government agencies, uh, financial institutions, tech companies, kind of runs a gamut. And we, what we what we really wanted to figure out was what tools are people currently using, what techniques, um, and what are their goals and motivation? You know, we, we hear a lot about different roles within companies. We, we know business analysts, we know data scientists, we know uh, researchers in academia. And we wanted to figure out if there were any commonalities between those folks and, and what they really felt was missing from uh, what available today. So, you know, that that was probably about six months worth of work to talk to those 75 people. And we learned a ton. And a lot of that informed uh, our first release, which was um, July in 2016. So since then, you know, now that we actually have a user base, uh, we've pivoted a little bit and we're able to talk to these folks in a testing capacity. So a lot of what we do now is we recruit active users on the platform and we we talk about different use cases they have. We talk about different scenarios. We put prototypes in front of them and really try to figure out whether we're starting to meet some of those needs we identified early in our research. Um, beyond the research aspect of it, we participated um, hackathons, panels, meetups, conferences. We try to be as involved as possible in this open data movement. We believe wholeheartedly in the movement. And and, and we've just tried to apply our learnings from all these uh, sessions that we've had with folks. You know, I think the the biggest thing that we took away from collaborating with these 200 data experts is regardless of your domain, your job title, your tool chain, um, at the end of the day, that the process of working with data ends up being very similar. So while a business analyst might use Excel um, to, you know, to try to figure out a problem that the business has, or a data scientist might use Python to get a feel for what's going on with uh, a given data set, um, both of them end up going through this very iterative process through this cycle, starting with a problem, sourcing data, Data, cleaning, prepping, understanding, performing an analysis, and then at the end of the day, uh, sharing their output with with other folks that they work with or with the broader community. So I think that was that was very enlightening for us to say, you know what, across all these disciplines, across all these roles, people end up working with data in very similar ways. And I would say too that that research really validated. You know, a lot of times you hear this stat out there that says, you know, people who work with data spend eighty percent of their time uh, finding the data, understanding the data, cleaning the data, and then they barely have any time left over to actually do you know, real analysis or real data work. And that, you know, I have to say, you know, at first I was very skeptical of this uh, saying, you know, we'd hear it so many times and, and cited in so many different places. But after speaking with all these, uh, these, these folks, it, it really rang true. And we realized that, um, you know, what, what the world of data science really needs is a way to make that go faster. And what we've really, you know, we kind of dubbed it internally, the first mile of data science. Uh, how can you get to the real valuable part of your job quicker? And that really inspires a lot of what we do based on what we what we heard. That's awesome. Moving on to the next question, based upon our understanding, a data project in data.world is when you're ready to share your collected data to the whole world. Why do you uh, make a distinction between data project and data set? Uh, so uh, this is an excellent question. Um, you know, one of the other things that we found that was most striking from uh, from our conversations and from our past experience was, you know, there's really uh, a difference between working on data and working with data. And, you know, it's a little bit of a, a philosophical distinction, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what I mean there. Uh, and so, you know, working on data, typically it's that it's that 80% case that we just mentioned, right? It's typically finding the right data to use, understanding uh, sort of ex in an exploratory fashion what's there, what's missing, what are the what are the problems, what are the, the, the good things about it. Um, but then in 
goes into cleaning and transforming, annotating that data, even maybe enhancing it, uh, bringing in additional uh, additional features, things like that. And but it's really all about it's focused on making that uh, data resource better, uh, both for you and for others. And so the data sets functionality in data.world really is uh, is kind of focused on on that, on sharing the data set, collecting the context around the data set itself, making the data better. And uh, working with the data is that 20 percent, that analysis, uh, that the actual data work that we we've been talking about, um, you know, which is supported by things like joining and querying. Um, and that's really what um, data projects and, and you know, the data workspace uh, in data.world is is focused around. And so what you end up with is you say, OK, well, I've got these data sets now that are, you know, maybe they're put out by, you know, an agency or one of the members of our community has uploaded them. Those can be enhanced over time. And those enhancements, you know, again, this is a community and, and kind of crowd crowdsourced uh, platform. And so those enhancements can be uh, it's not the responsibility of just one person, the person doing that work. I can go into the platform and I can find a data set that's been, uh, you know, maybe the community has spent, you know, months and months, um, you know, understanding and making better. Uh, and then I get to start from where they left off uh, and not have to re reinvent the wheel every time. And then um, with data projects, you know, what you have is the ability to bring in multiple different data sets together almost as if they were dependencies uh, to your data project and start to figure out how do they work together? How do they, uh, how are they joinable? How are they queryable? And all the while, when you're working on that uh, data project, uh, we like to say that it, it can be kind of self-documenting. And so all of the work that you're doing can be reflected in that data project as well. So really what that ends up um, looking like is that a data set is a way to share, you know, a canonical data resource or to produce a canonical data resource. And a data project is a way to share the process and the conclusions that have come from the analysis that you've done. Um, so you can kind of see how those two concepts work really uh, symbiotically together. Oh. Uh, and the other the other point, you know, I, I mentioned like bringing data sets together and joining. Uh, so it's it's one interesting uh, point about our platform is that uh, we're, we're really built on top of the concept of the semantic web and of linked uh, graph data. So what that means, you know, when data comes into our system, when we ingest it, we turn it all into the same format under the hood, into these linked data triple so it's actually stored in RDF uh, format. And uh, what that enables us to do is to uh, to actually make all of that data joinable with any other data in the system. So on one hand, you can actually think about our platform where a, a file gets uploaded or a data set gets created in the system, and it becomes part of one big database uh, along with every other data set in the system. And so that's what makes all of the multiple data sets immediately joinable with each other. And that power further extends to a user who may be bringing in their own private data or company bringing in their own private data, well, now they've got all of the open data on the platform, they can easily start to join in. So you can imagine maybe a company has like, you know, sales data, and they want to bring in some information from the US Census, uh, we make that very easy to do to join all that open data in uh, as well. And so that's really what data projects uh, excels. For. Nice. One uh, addition on I'm sorry, uh, on data projects is your work now becomes uh, reviewable and reproducible by either stakeholders at your company or by other folks who are interested in the same uh, data domain. So when you talk about projects having uh, something like a workspace where you can do joins, queries, and some of your analysis, it also gives you a place to uh, include that derived insight, share those narratives, and have that uh, be available for other folks who come across your project to, to be able to read alongside the data. So not only the context, the multiple data sets, but then the output, um, which kind of completes the cycle on a, a data project uh, from kind of the initial question that you start out with to the learnings and knowledge that, that come out on the other end. That's great. I can't wait to play with data world a lot more and tinker with that data project and data sets out there. Now, you have mentioned a few things about the workspace out there, and I'm just curious, would you like to add to this more, like a how to best leverage workspace in data.world and how, how do I, how, how to best visualize this? Is this some sort of integrated development environment on your side? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, workspace, uh, you know, when we talk about working with data, that's really where the, the workspace excels. And and yeah, you can almost think of it as like a light IDE um, for, for the data project that you're working on. And so you can launch a workspace from any uh, data set or data project in the system. And what you end up with is an easy way to be able to, to view files, to see summary stats about the files. So you can see things uh, like, you know, average, uh, you know, mean, median, uh, standard deviation of different columns. You can understand how empty or how full different columns are, how sparse the data might might be. Um, we have a, a feature in there called the data inspector, which will 
uh, as you you know you upload a file and it'll tell you you know things like hey maybe you're missing uh, values here or these values look like placeholders and can kind of go through the data very quickly and have help you understand um, the quality of that data uh, and then you have uh, easy access to the data dictionary so places where you know if, if maybe Alex and I are collaborating uh, on something I can go and start labeling columns and put descriptions for columns and files so he has a better understanding of what's there and then ultimately you get into the query and visualization tools and so you know the, the query uh, any files uh, and tables in the system can be queried with uh, SQL and so joining data sets in the workspace is as simple as writing a SQL query and treating those uh, different data sets as different tables. Um, and we also uh, support Sparkle queries as well for those who may be familiar with a, a popular query language uh, against graph data and the semantic web. And then uh, we, we have a exploratory visualization tool uh, in there that helps you, you know, take different columns and plot them against each other uh, to try to get a sense, you know, visually of what's in the data. And so all of this uh, exists in the system. And uh, we have a, a pretty robust set of, you know, APIs and connectors, because what we realized was it was important to have these tools in the platform to support, uh, you know, exploratory analysis and and and, and sort of prototyping of, of different things um, to, again, to get that 80% um, of the work to happen a lot faster, but we didn't want to replace anybody's existing tool chain. You know, every person uh, has their own tools and techniques that they use, uh, whether it be, you know, Python, R, Tableau, uh, Excel, and so on. And so um, we decided very early on that the most important part was for us to have a very robust API and set of connectors so that it's easy to get the data into data.world to, you know, be able to do this kind of exploration and, and cleaning and then get it out uh, into your tool chain of choice and then very easily get the conclusions and the output of your analysis back into data.world into a project. So we've got uh, integrations for, like I've mentioned, Python, R, Excel, Tableau, uh, and, and all of our connectors actually are open source, kind of been going with this community model. And, and we've been really excited to see some of our community start to uh, contribute um, their own connectors as well. Uh, and so we really see the combination of workspace and the APIs and connectors uh, as, as enabling this kind of data collaboration and data work. I got a few follow-up questions. Um, how many data uh, data connectors are you supporting right now and are there any of them focused on like a big data platforms such as Hadoop or Cassandra? We have about, uh, I think we have nine live data connectors today. Um, for things such as, uh, you know, Hadoop, we do support uh, uh, JDBC. Um, so anything uh, that has a JDBC interface can be integrated uh, fairly easily. Um, what we've found with, you know, whether it's, you know, real-time uh, database systems or things like, like Hadoop, that what was most important to users was understanding the metadata and being able to get snapshots of that data. So no matter how much uh, people were using things like Hadoop um, or you know large databases like Redshift, ultimately the currency that people were using uh, in this type of data work was, was still emailing CSVs and spreadsheets around. And so we realized that um, the right kind of connection there is not necessarily a real-time connection, but the ability to, to capture the metadata and to snapshot the data that is needed for that specific type of, uh, of analysis. All right, thank you. So then in the data set, do you import data or have just live connection to it only? Yeah, so we typically, we support importing data. We're working on uh, some some techniques to do uh, to do data streaming into the system. Um, but, you know, like I was mentioning before, we realized that that uh, ultimately, you know, we, we actually even have an internal saying here, which is, you know, stop emailing spreadsheets uh, <laughs> because we found that, you know, no matter what, that was how uh, ultimately how people were, were, you know, sending data back and forth and, and communicating, uh, you know, the results of the analysis they were doing. And, you know, that's, while it, it works, it's a relatively low friction way of doing things. You, again, you lose the context of that data. You don't understand anymore who uh, who was working on it or who, um, or where it came from, um, if, you know, lost in the email somewhere. So that's that, that kind of tribal knowledge that's there uh, uh, tends to get lost. Uh, and then, you know, that's not to mention too, things like security and access control. And so everything in our system has pretty fine grained uh, access control and security, but, uh, uh, again, you lose all that when you email the spreadsheets around. So, um, but with these connectors, um, our strategy is to allow you to connect to any kind of data source uh, and to be able to uh, to stream in data or to take snapshots.
shots of data. One thing to, to add on there is, is obviously fresh and accurate data are, are of extreme importance. The, on the other hand, the one thing that we're trying to balance, especially uh, with this concept of canonical data sets that, you know, however many people downstream might be using your data sets, we also want to make sure that some of these things don't change out from under you while you're working on them. So um, Joe mentioned earlier that we'd like to look at data sets as dependencies in a project. Um, so in, a, in order to both have these, these batch kind of uh, snapshots, even from a streaming source, we thought was very important. Now, one other thing you mentioned that uh, organizations can, uh, or each user can bring their uh, own data uh, that could be possibly uh, propriety. Now, did you ha get any feedback regarding privacy related concern or how do you make sure somebody's not sharing sensitive financial data of a private company or, or a patient data that may fall into PHI or other uh, similar regular data industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, this is something that I, I think in the, in the public case, you know, we rely on the, on the community to be able to, you know, maybe see something that looks suspicious and flag it, um, you know, and it's not too dissimilar from, you know, even a system kind of like YouTube um, or, uh, you know, a photo sharing site where, you know, you allow user contributions and, um, you know, there, there's like a, has to be kind of a, a, a system and, and, and a process for, for alerting and taking those things down. But ultimately, we, we put that responsibility in the hands of, of our users. And, you know, if you are, um, you know, we, we follow, um, we follow very robust security guidelines, uh, both, you know, internally and with our, you know, everything's hosted for us in the cloud providers. And we, we have, um, you know, we have kind of a page on our website that details the, the security procedures that we have and that we follow. But ultimately, you know, each company kind of has their own uh, willingness to uh, to share data and to uh, what's what's what they feel comfortable with uh, sharing in, in this kind of space. And so we um, we really recommend, hey, you know, like health information or financial information, you know, please don't don't share those kinds of things publicly. Um, but we really leave that power to our users uh, to make those decisions. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of times like the, the lingua franca here is people emailing around spreadsheets. And so it's been sort of interesting when we talk to people and they say, well, you know, we we have to keep our data very secure and we don't want to put it in the cloud. And I say, well, what happens when you run that analysis and you have to send, you know, over to, you know, your your product manager or to your business analyst, the results of this this analysis? And I say, well, I, you know, I email them a spreadsheet and it says, well, now you've, you know, maybe you put it into a system like Google Sheets or something, and now you've put it into your email system. And so, you know, a lot of times there's um, there's a perception that the existing methods that people are using are, are very highly secure. Uh, but in fact, um, there's sort of this, this hole here when it comes to finally distributing things. And so, um, you know, after kind of pointing that out a lot of times to, to um, some of our users, they start to realize that actually it's more secure to be able to have that kind of fine grained access control. Uh, and, you know, they feel confident in, you know, the, the security measures that we take to be able to put some of the proprietary data uh, up in the system. And some, something else that's worth uh, mentioning, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about our interviews with hospitals and, and financial institutions. And the thing that we notice there is often organizations have a strict, more strict set of rules than individuals. So a lot of that uh, functionality is baked into our organization's pro uh, feature set. So things like um, default organization wide settings where we default all data sets to private until they've been reviewed by an administrator, um, things like that. Uh, that's where we've seen that come up most frequently. Are there any interesting stats about uh, data.world? Uh, let's say how much data you're working with or maybe uh, top 10 most interesting data project you have right now or any other interesting story? Uh, would you like to share? Well, I have one, uh, one, one funny story um, and one, uh, you know, very, uh, I think, very interesting story. And so start with a very interesting one. Um, there's a group, uh, a, a, a kind of nonprofit collective that's uh, that was formed uh, last year called Data for Democracy. And the Data for Democracy group, it's it's sort of a, you know, I think they have a Slack group. They're over 12 or 1300 members now. And um, what they wanted to do is to try to, you know, collect uh, data and understand it and analyze it in order to sort of elevate um, you know, certain things identified as like social issues or social problems. Um, and they, you know, flocked to uh, data.world and, and did some really interesting stuff. And so you can go and you can do uh, searches on data.world to try to see what they've, um, what they've done there, uh, and what sorts of things they've, um, they've problems they've chosen to tackle. Um, and then I'll, I'll share kind of a, a funny one, which is, um, we had a, a, one of our internal people here who did um, uh, some analysis about Bigfoot, Bigfoot sightings, uh, I guess I'd say alleged Bigfoot sightings mm -hmm. um and uh alongside the uh you know the, i think they they were trying to show a good example of being able to join data and they uh they they took uh eclipse information about where the path of the eclipse and they tried to, to make uh predictions about the best places that you could see you know potentially see bigfoot during the 
clips. And so even something funny like that, um, you know, the analysis was done in a very serious way. And ultimately, uh, you know, we actually realized not too long ago, we were looking at, um, you know, traffic that comes to our site from search engines like Google. And actually, we rank very, very highly for the term Bigfoot data in Google. So we thought, <laughs> That's fun. I actually went to uh, Missouri and Kansas City when the recent uh, total solar eclipse happened. And unfortunately, chose a site that had raining all day long. Oh, no. <laughs> there was no cloud opening. So what we ended up doing is uh, uh, driving around uh, until we found one area uh, somewhere in, toward Kansas City. There was a little opening. We got to see a little bit. But uh, mostly it went around doing like, drive-by videos showing how people were lining up by the side of the highway <laughs> to get a picture or a glimpse of it. <laughs> wow. Well, at least you got to see a, a little bit of it, I suppose. That's right. We, uh, <laughs> partial, partial clips here in, in Texas. And so we got mm. the whole team together. We got a couple pairs of glasses and, uh, and went up on the roof. But uh, certainly it sounds like you got to see the, the, the full eclipse, which was, uh, must have been pretty impressive. Yeah, it was fun. The whole, as you were, There's like a YouTube video I have. You can see the whole uh, highway turned dark completely. Yeah, it almost felt like evening. Yeah, that was impressive. Yeah. <laughs> we got a little bit cooler even. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, um, we are almost to the end of our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. We had a great talk. We learned a lot and it was very, very lively. We really appreciate your time and the effort you took in putting together all the, the interview. And just before we let you go, would you please uh, share with us the Twitter or LinkedIn or any professional blogging website that people would be able to connect with? Sure, absolutely. I would encourage you um, if you are, you know, data.world member to find me, uh, you know, data.world slash uh, Jay Boutros. Um, my, uh, you know, again, my LinkedIn is also, you know, Joe Boutros. I think on Twitter, I'm a context junkie, all one word. And I'm at data.world slash Azel, A-Z-E-L, and on Twitter at A underscore Z-E-L. That's great. Uh, thank you both very much for taking the time out of your busy day. So uh, it was really awesome. And thank you for joining us. Thanks thank for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Data Podcast. You're welcome to follow our hosts on Twitter at Rajib2k5, at Shabnam Khan 2017, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash Rajib2k5. Our episodes are also available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Google, and other podcasting platforms. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>